In 1918, the First World War came to a close with a decisive victory for the Entente. The next year, a series of settlements were forced upon the defeated Central Powers, the most famous of which was the Treaty of Versailles, which saw Germany stripped of vast lands. Eighteen months earlier, Germany had imposed its own peace treaty on Russia, taking control of a vast swath of Eastern Europe. Yet, these treaties were products of the circumstances in which victory was achieved. For the Entente, it was after the war had become about self-determination, and was increasingly dominated by the United States. For Germany, it was only after Russia had begun to disintegrate as a coherent state. Neither the Entente nor the Central Powers ever truly fulfilled their desired peace plans or their vision of a post-war world. This video then will look at the war aims of each, war aims of each, of the five great powers that entered the First World War in 1914, how they changed, and how they imagined the post-war world. Germany, the first power we'll look at, is Germany the principal combatant for the central powers, and arguably the nation. With the most radical vision for restructuring the European order, German aims fluctuated throughout the conflict, often depending on who dominated the government at the time. Nevertheless, there were serious proposals on what concessions Germany desired from the war. The first of these is the most infamous, the September Program. Envisaged in 1914, when it seemed like Germany was on course for a quick victory. This was about as Carthaginian a peace as was imagined by any nation in the war. In the West, Germany was to annex resource-rich areas in France, such as the Braille, such as the Braille region, and Belgium was to be turned into a puppet state in control of the channel ports to threaten Britain. Perhaps the most striking thing about this proposal is the remarkable similarity in the East. To the land Germany actually took in the Treaty of Brest Litovsk almost four years later. It arguably reflects the fact that, for most German diplomats, the main war was in the East, where the greatest spoils were to be had for Germany in terms of resource rich land. Though Germany's war aims in Russia did always remain far more fluid than its demands in the West. West. Evidently, the September program was never implemented, at least in the West. As Germany's armies were defeated at the Battle of the Marne, the subsequent descent into trench warfare meant German diplomats saw a favorable negotiated peace, rather than total victory, as the main aim of Germany's war effort. Instead, Bethmann Hallwig, the often vague suggestions of the German Chancellor until 1917, was ultimately ousted in 1917, so never got to seriously attempt to negotiate a negotiated settlement. Next, there was a plan advocated by German Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz, who had been instrumental in the creation of Germany's high seas fleet prior to the war. Tirpitz never really got near the levers of diplomatic power, but his plans are interesting for how completely delusional they are. Tirpitz saw the war as a struggle for world rather than European, su rather than European supremacy. Thus, he believed the British Empire and its command of the sea lanes was the main enemy to defeat. Britain, he advocated signing a white peace with Russia in the east, and focusing on the western front, annexing the channel ports to prepare for the next war, which would be a final clash against Britain. Finally, there was the plan of the Third Ole, dominated by Hindenburg and Ludendorff, in case of victory in 1918. This was after peace had been made with Russia. In the March of that year, Ludendorff saw Russia's defeat only as a preliminary to total victory in the West. In reality, though, there were never any concrete proposals. But we can assume it would have been similar to the September program. Almost all of these plans came attached with the proposal for a German-led economic union, with the rest of Europe that would provide a market for German guide a market for German goods and exclude Britain, generally known as Mitteleuropa, based on a book written in 1915, though it wasn't actually an authoritative policy statement. The common theme here is that this was not a war of survival for Germany. Even supposed compromised pieces aimed to ensure 
Germany was supreme on the continent for the foreseeable future. In the end, this refusal to compromise meant Germany ended up being completely defeated in 1918, with even Brest-Litovsk being annulled by the Entente. Entente. France, of all the combatants in the First World War, France had the single clearest war aim, the reclamation of Alsace-Lorraine. The territory had been amputated from France in 1871 after the Franco-Prussian War, and the desire to reclaim the territory had stimulated revanchist sentiment in the country since. The territory was so vital that despite the fact German armies sat deep inside French territory, for most of the war, French diplomats almost totally refused to contemplate any negotiated peace that didn't include Alsace-Lorraine. France was also motivated more than any nation by hostility to Germany, which had replaced France as Europe's preeminent power in 1871. Consequently, French war aims were also shaped around finding ways of limiting German power. These ranged from the most hardline stances that Germany should be vulcanized, should be vulcanized, to the comparatively moderate position that the imbalance between Germany and France should be redressed. One way this could be done was by annexing more German territory. The French, for much of the war, maintained designs on the coal-heavy region of the Saarland, which would be annexed to increase France's industrial strength. More extensive plans advocated the setting up of a rump Rhenish state to provide security for France. Whilst in the early days of the war, the French military even considered Recreating France's natural borders by annexing all of the left bank of the Rhine. There are other more minor colonial claims, particularly affecting Syria. But ultimately, French warriors were almost solely focused on weakening Germany and strengthening France in the European balance of power. In the end, France would reclaim Alsace-Lorraine, but would have to settle for it but would have to settle for a demilitarized Rhineland and the separation of the Saarland, as a League of Nations mandate, eventually to be annexed back into Germany. Rush Russia was a nation that was in an almost perpetual crisis of self-confidence over what the war was actually being fought for. The initial cases Beli had been defending the Slavic brother state Serbia from annihilation, but as the body count began stacking up, this wasn't a particularly sellable point to the Russian public. When Russia went to war, the Supreme Commander Nikolai Nikolajevich published a manifesto promising the creation of a Polish state within the Russian Empire. The aim was to do this by joining Congress Poland with German and Austrian Polish regions. This would serve the more general Russian aim of weakening Germany and destroying Austria as a competitor in the Balkans. The Russians never went as far, though, as to specify the complete destruction of the Habsburgs, for fear that the collapse of this multi-ethnic empire would encourage the Russians' own minorities to rebel. Minorities to rebel. Despite these territorial aims, there was a degree of Germanophilia running throughout the Russian elite, who saw the conflict less as a clash between nation-states and more as a clash between the liberal West and the autocratic East that Russia just happened to be on the wrong side of. This view was silenced by the entry of Russia's perennial foe, the Ottoman Empire, into the war. The foreign minister Sazanov was able to extract a commitment from Britain and France that Russia would take Constantinople at the end of the war, formerly the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, which Russia claimed to be a successor of. The city would also finally give Russia access to the Mediterranean, after the war became an almost holy endeavor against the Muslim Turks. A separate peace with Germany was never seriously discussed, and Russia remained committed to, Russia remained committed to the war effort until the Bolshevik Revolution. The overthrow of the Tsar in the February Revolution did change Russia's war aims, but I won't go into them here. In sum, then, Russian war aims look something like this. In the end, the October Revolution meant Russia instead signed a humiliating peace treaty, only undone because of an Entente victory in the West. Austria-Hungary, Austria's war aims were what had brought about the conflict in 1914. 
For a decade, this multi-ethnic empire was plagued by instability in its Slavic areas. Because of a resurgent Serbian state that aimed to unify with these regions. Consequently, when the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated by the Serbian Black Hand, the Austrians saw it as an opportunity to crush the Serbs once and for all. Somewhat bizarrely, the Austrians didn't actually intend to annex any of Serbia. They had too many Slavs already, and any more would upset the fragile balance within the Habsburg Empire. Instead, they intended to make sure Serbia would never again challenge Austria. Doing this by partitioning it between Bulgaria and Greece, and then turning the rump state into a vassal. Montenegro would have its coastline taken to truly box the Serbs in. In 1915, in 1915, Italy joined the war against Austria. But the Habsburg lines held thanks to the natural fortifications on the border. And thus, only minor territorial adjustments were considered in the event of Italy's defeat. In 1916, Romania joined the war, but was defeated. In 1918, they signed a peace agreement that showed us Austrian aims, which mainly consisted of turning it into an economic puppet of the Central Powers. Russia was Austria's main enemy throughout the conflict, but proposals in case of victory were always vague. There was the so-called Austro-Polish solution to combine Congress Poland with Austrian Poland into an autonomous kingdom under Habsburg rule. But this clashed with Germany's aim for a Polish puppet state. Instead, it was generally thought Austria would share. In the economic spoils of the rump states Germany carved out, states Germany carved out of Russia, something they largely achieved in the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Ultimately, Austria's war aims consisted little in the way of major territorial changes, but simply what Austrian diplomats thought would secure the empire's future something that was looking increasingly bleak as the war continued. Britain. Britain entered the war with no territorial ambitions. And this remained consistent, at least in Europe. Her main cases belly had been Germany's invasion of Belgium. And Belgian independence remained Britain's main demand throughout the war. For Britain, the destruction of the German high seas fleet, which challenged the Royal Navy's dominance in the North Sea was also a crucial aim. Those were, by and large, what Britain focused on. But the secondary aim was maintaining a balance of power in Europe. In practice, this meant restricting German expansion. To do this, they tied other allies' war aims, such as the French demands for Alsace-Lorraine, to their own, seeing it as a way to weaken Germany. This is not to say Britain had no territorial aims of its own. Once the Ottomans entered the war, the Middle East in particular became an area of interest to Brit area of interest to Britain. This was carved up in a treaty known as Sykes Pico today, which gave Britain influence over these regions. Despite this, of all belligerents, British war aims were the most flexible, as would be seen at Versailles when Britain attempted to facilitate an awkward compromise between the idealistic Americans and revanchist French. In the end, they were mostly achieved, Belgium was liberated, the high seas fleet was scuttled by the Germans, and the Middle East was partitioned. Though Britain quickly reverted to its favored method of informal empire after the peace treaty. Perhaps most importantly, however, Britain failed to preserve a balance of power on the continent. The war saw the destruction of the Austrian Empire, whilst the Russians turned insular. That left just France and Germany and out of these. Germany was always going to be the most powerful and to be the most powerful once its strength recovered. One interesting theme in all of these is that war aims didn't necessarily get more harsh as the war went on. The September program was about as harsh a piece as anything Germany would have come up with in 1918. What's more striking is the increasing intransigence of all belligerents to avoid coming to a settlement as all policymakers failed to find a compromise to the crisis of 1914. So they failed to find one that could have brought the war to a close. close.